that's the truth. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And that is absolutely the truth. Let's see. Let's put this back up there and get ourselves rolling and going. It is a good morning. Thank you all for your continued prayers. Let you know Michaela is home from the hospital. Uh, they thought uh, yesterday at one point, if <coughs> things didn't <coughs> turn, around, <coughs> turn around, they'd have to... Uh, Put a feeding tube in, and I'm sure that's not completely ruled out yet, but uh, uh, they sent her home, and uh, she'll see her OB, see how things are going. Basically, over the last three weeks, when she couldn't hold anything down, she completely voided everything in her system. There was nothing to go through her system, and uh, so she was, for all intents and purposes, starving to death. But she did say this morning that she has held stuff down, uh, a little queasy. She is home. You know, trying to get over the pain from the surgery and all of that. Uh, Shauna's with her at this point. So uh, uh, just keep her in your prayers. Really, really appreciate it. And I am doing some better today. I didn't know that was going to be the case. I had a run-in with a, let's see, I was bent over and I had a run-in with a shopping cart and a young boy who apparently thought it was a racing car. And uh, it and I met and... Uh, you know, uh, but I uh, stiff last night, but I came through that just fine. God is good. God is great. And, uh, you know, I told my son what happened and he started laughing. He said, I know it's not funny, Dad, but it is. So I guess that tells you the strange humor that runs through my family. Uh, but we are <coughs> here together this morning. And Rick, you're the first up this morning. So I'm going to say hello to you and Lena. It's good to see you this morning. Miss Cynthia, Mr. Ryan, we love you. Good morning. Mr. Daniel, good morning, everyone. Hope you all have a great day. I do too, Mr. Daniel, and you be careful welding and listening and uh, shouting hallelujah, whatever you do, and uh, love your testimony. He works for a Christian guy, and they uh, uh, they have all kinds of great conversations. That is kind of really neat. Uh, Miss Carolyn, good morning to you, my friend, my friend, my friend. What a precious lady. Miss Sherry says, good morning, beloved brothers and sisters. We're praying for you, and I love you too, my dear. And Miss Terry, we love you, we love you, we love you. And Miss Sue, good morning to you. Brenda, good morning to you. Shout out to Brent. God bless both of you. I go there Saturday and they're working away down at the church. I went to take care of a couple of things and uh, check on the baptistry, and Josh was filling it for me. And uh, Brenda is vacuuming chairs and stuff. You know, it's precious when you look out there and you, you find you know the family just all teamed up together to do the work. Miss Therese, good morning to you. God is love. Yes, he is. Absolutely. First John tells us that, and all through the Bible confirms that. Miss Helen, good morning to you, and a thumbs up, too, as well. Debbie, good morning. Miss Melstrom, it is good to see you out there this morning with your family. Give them all a big hug for us, if you would. Miss Stacy, I hope you are feeling better up on your feet, moving around, and doing a lot better uh, now that you're about a week out from, actually, you're seven days out from your surgery, so uh, uh, it's good to see you out there. And I love the hearts, and we love you too. All right. Uh, Debbie sends us a heart too. I like that. All right. Well, we've been looking at the other side of the coin. Uh, we've been looking at, we looked at our responsibility to government to submit uh you know, uh, and yesterday I asked you all to participate, and you did. You did a good job. I asked you to share, uh, as I was sharing out of Scripture, incidents and times that you can think of in the history uh, of the church in, in our lifetime or whatever, even in, in Scripture, because I didn't get all of them, of course, where man did not obey the authority that was over them. Rather, they obeyed God. As Peter said, is it uh, better that we obey men or obey God? And, of course, the answer to that is God. We are to uh, submit to authority as long as authority isn't telling us to do something to uh, uh, that goes against the word of God. Uh, but uh, when that happens, though we submit to authority, we don't obey authority. Miss Terry says, we are so thankful for those who that showed up for work day. 
uh, when Buck and Janice and I were at the OCC meeting and couldn't be there. Well, I can tell you, it. Uh, uh, I'm thankful too because uh, you know it, it's the it's the body of believers. It's all of you that keeps everything going and running, and you know, especially you know, even in the physical plan, keeping it as as in good shape as it is. Uh, may God bless. So we talked about the difference yesterday, did we? Of submission and obedience. We are called to submit to those in authority over us, but that does not necessarily mean that we are called to obey that authority. If that authority goes against a higher authority, God's authority, then our duty is to obey God. Uh, Though there's often an overlap between submission and obedience, they are not the same thing. You can obey without submitting, and you can submit without obeying. Uh, it's just that simple. Michael, good morning to you, my good friend. Uh, I love you, and uh, uh, just just a great brother, just a great brother. Uh, submission is about our placing ourselves willfully, willingly, under someone's authority or oversight. It's not merely about our action. It's about our relationship to them. I used the, uh, the uh, illustration yesterday of paying our, say, paying property taxes. You and I may not like doing that. The guy that doesn't like to do it, he submits to government. He does it. He obeys, but he doesn't do it with a submissive heart. You know what I mean? He gets, goes out and gathers it all in pennies and takes a wheelbar in and dumps the pennies in the middle of the tax office. Well, that's obedience, but without submission. Because it is, uh, you know, you can tell it in the heart. There's a rebellion there, an unsubmissive heart, though there is obedience. And we can be submissive and then not obey, uh, as we see several times in Scripture. But are we willing to pay the consequences for not obeying that authority? Therein is the difference. Uh, Miss Teresa Stewart is saying good morning, and we love you. Good morning, Miss Teresa. I don't know whether you work or not, but we love you. It's good to see you out there. Uh, so yesterday we looked at examples, scriptural examples. Peter, John, the apostles before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish midwives under Pharaoh, uh, king of Egypt, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego uh, disobeyed Nebuchadnezzar, uh, his order to worship false gods. Daniel did the same thing, a refusal to pray to anyone but God, and, and, and he prayed to God and faced the lion's den because of it, right? That's submission without obedience. Christians in Damascus, they refused to turn Paul over to the authorities. Rather, they helped him escape. In addition to that, many of you posted such things as those who helped Jews escape, uh, hid them or helped them escape Nazi terrorism during World War II uh, and before. Uh, Elijah defying King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel. Uh, what about uh, uh, what about John the Baptist? That's one we didn't even talk about. Uh, defying uh, the king, uh, defying Herod, Luther defying the Church, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, possibly, uh, as was brought out, the lockdown orders denying the right to assemble, gather together as a church. Uh, I see that as. Uh, submission to authority, would we uh, pay the consequences? Yes, certainly. But it wasn't one of those things I was willing, uh, not in myself, to obey. Uh, now, we encourage people to do what was right in their own heart, what they believed God would have them to do, keep themselves safe and protected. But to tell the church, uh, and under our form of government, we have the freedom of religion. There's supposed to be this separation. For the government to come in and give dictate to the church or for them to say there are certain things you can't teach, certain things you can't preach, as is, is beginning to happen. These are things that uh, violate and go against a higher, more supreme law. Submit to authority, but not obey. Now, the question arose, and that's where we ended yesterday, is what about the uniqueness of the United States? And I had a couple questions for you that said, well, you know, uh, uh, you've had discussions with people about the fact that uh, uh, we don't have kings and uh, those kinds of authorities. So therefore, you know, it says honor the king, uh, love God, honor the king. Uh, so uh, you know, we're 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 left off of this. Well, and there's some of you that just sent me a question mark. What do you mean? Well, that's what we're going to talk about as we wrap this section up. 
You see, there is an argument, and I've heard it a number of times, as some of you have, obviously, and I've heard it in various ways, that basically says that Romans 13 doesn't apply to, to American Christians because of the uniqueness of our country. They say we are a representative republic. We are governed by laws and not by a king or an emperor. And by our system of government, government officials answer to the people, not the people uh, to these officials. To which I usually say, oh, really? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so very much that we can come together. And Lord, we lay before you your word. We want to understand it. We want to know it. We want you, Lord, to, to uh, lift it up in a way that uh, each one of us can take from that word what you're saying to us and apply it to our life. God, we don't want to be hearers of the word. We want to be effectual doers. We want to live out of the word of God. We want to continual day, continue daily in the word, progress in the word of God. And that cannot happen, Lord, unless we are doing, we are practicing, we are living out the word that you have given us. Lord, to be effectual doers, to be continuing in the word of God is one way, Lord, uh, that men and women in this world would know that we are your disciples. So, Father, I thank you that you have called us to be a people of the book. And, that, Lord, I just pray that the book be our the guide and the instrument, the tool within our life that guides our steps. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you, Lord, for this time and for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, I, I don't really want to go too deep into some sort of civics lesson or a history lesson. I, I love our nation, and I love some of the relative unique aspects of our nation. I love the idea of American exceptionalism. It doesn't mean that uh, we're better than anybody else in the world. It just means that under, you know, under that banner, you and I can, can progress. We are, are uh, uh, given, uh, you know, we have the right and, and, and the, the privilege and the ability to exceed what, uh, what might be allowed in other countries because of the freedoms that we have. However, we're not the first country to be a republic. We're not the first country to have a constitution or believe government officials derive their right from the governed, uh, from the consent of the people. Read the Magna Carta if you don't, uh, uh, don't believe that. Uh, just understand. We're even far from the first to ever be founded by men and women who knew and loved and even quoted the Bible. If Romans 13 doesn't apply to us, then, my friends, it, it, it hardly applies to anyone today because none of us uh, live under the kind of uh, government, not, not completely and totally, and under that, that whole thing you say, well, there are people who live under totalitarian governments. Yes, there are, but not as uniquely as Rome. And let me ask you another question. Because of the uniqueness we have as, as, as a people, should we then uh, do this with other parts of the Bible as well? Dismiss it because our cultural context has changed? You tell me what cultural context has not changed over the last 2,000 years. Yeah. Now, I agree that, you know, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. But, one of the struggles that we have is when we look at the Word of God, understanding the context in which it's spoken, is to see then how it does fit in our particular cultural context and apply it. Many feel they have the right to violently rebel against government if a law is passed that they feel is unconstitutional or may even be unconstitutional. But the thing is, we do have a mechanism for determining whether or not laws are constitutional, do we not? Oh, it takes a while. I would agree. It, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Maybe our problem is, is that uh, we're too much a Microsoft, microwave people. Uh, we want our meal done in five minutes. We don't want to take the time that it takes to take all of the raw ingredients and put them together and fix a meal. We want it now. And we want the same thing when it comes to social justice or when it comes to you know, other things that, uh, uh, that we fight again. You know, I want things changed now. 
don't you? But there is a right way to do it. And we have in our play, in, in our constitution, we have we have a mechanism whereby that can take place. Oh, is that being eroded? Certainly it is. Do we have to be on guard? Absolutely. Under our system, citizens cannot just decide for themselves that the law is unconstitutional and then violently oppose government. No, there's a process. That's not how our system works. We must appeal. You know, through the courts, we have the right, biblically, illegally, to appeal all the way up and including to the Supreme Court. Though our context today is certainly different than the first century Rome, our instructions to be submissive and not seditious is still the same. We can't get away with that. If a law cannot be obeyed by a follower of Jesus, then he must disobey that law because there's a higher law we're appealing to. But we do so respectfully and submissively within the confines of, of, uh, of, of what is given us, yielding even to the government's right to punish us if we're convicted. And that's the part we don't want. Do we? So let's talk a minute uh, just about submission and uh, what well, we did, obedience. But look at, uh, uh, I'm behind, submission and, and allegiance. Just as there's a difference between submission and obedience, there is a difference between submission and allegiance. By saying, being subject to the governing authorities, Paul is not saying, give your allegiance to your country or your government. Those who are really captured in uh, very bad situations, say in, you know, in, in communist China, in other places under uh, you know, uh, uh, strict Muslim rule, Sharia law, their allegiance may not belong to their country. Right? Paul wasn't saying that Christians in Rome should be Roman patriots or Christians in, in Afghanistan should be Afghani patriots or Iran should be Irani patriots or Christians in, uh, in, in the Gaza should be uh, 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 Palestinian patriots. No. People in America... You know, we're not necessarily called to be American patriots. I don't have a problem with patriotism, as you all know. I are one. A person can be a complete stranger to a nation and still be subject to the governing authorities. I've been in many nations across the world. When I'm in that nation, I am subject to their laws. Am I not? Yeah, listen, folks. Sometimes Americans go out there in the world and uh, they think they can do whatever they want to and ignore the laws of the country that they're in because they're Americans and they cannot do that. When you're there, if I take a trip to China, I would need to be subject to these Chinese authorities. But I would not give my allegiance to China, right? I'd be a sojourner, a pilgrim, which of course is the way we're supposed to think of ourselves even within the bounds of our own precious country. Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from freshly lusts which wage against your soul. In this world, that's what I am. I am an ambassador for the kingdom of God. That's where I do belong. That's where my eternal citizenship is registered. Paul says to the church in Corinth, he says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God, through though making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I'm an ambassador in Tigard, Oregon, in Portland, Oregon. 
I'm an ambassador. If, 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 if I go to India, I'm an ambassador to that country. I'm an ambassador to the Philippines. I'm an ambassador to Mexico. I'm an ambassador to Arizona. Wherever I go, I'm an ambassador of Christ. I represent my king and my kingdom. I find it ironic that we think we're supposed to be sojourners on the earth, pilgrims just passing through, but we still bleed our national colors. Now, I, I, don't get me wrong. I stand up for my nation. I love my country. I want to be the best citizen that I can possibly be. But sometimes those two ideas are in conflict with each other. Why do we feel we shouldn't be attached to the earth but feel it's perfectly acceptable to get attached to uh, in, in such a way that uh, we have made our nation you know, more our God? Listen, being a patriot is not a sin. It's not forbidden. In fact, I would hope that every one of you out there love your country, love your nation, have some pride in it. Doesn't mean that we hit, hide our head in the sand and ignore uh, our problems, our failings. We are a failing society. Let's face it. We have mega problems in our nation. But waving the flag is not going to solve those problems. We have children being abducted on the street. We have human trafficking out of out of proportion. We have we have drug abuse. We have people dying in in epidemic proportion from fentanyl overdose. I could go on and on and on and on and on. The moral fiber of this country has come unthreaded. But at the core and the heart, I still love my country. But when our patriotism is turned into a matter of worship. Or we attend to marry the church with the state. We are in error. Honor the king. Honor your form of government. Honor those that are in authority over you. But fear Worship, reference God first and foremost. As I said, being a patriot is not turning a blind eye to our sins and our failures in a nation. It is to call our nation to repentance, to get on its knees before God and cry out for our sin. Well, our true citizenship is the kingdom of God. His is the greatest nation, unshakable and eternal. Let's see, Miss Linda come in. Good morning, Miss Linda. Yay. Love and want God's best for it, for our nation. Amen, Sherry. That's right. Don't put your head in the sand. Don't ignore the issues that are there. Strive to make it better. The only way to make it better is to bring Christ to the bear, to the, to the forefront. Our duty as Christians is to stand against and even disobey ungodliness wherever it may be. Even if it's found in our government. But this does not mean through violent means. Doesn't mean it does mean though that we pray, we vote, we petition, we show our grievances in compliance with the law of our land. We're not idle, we're not passive. We get involved. It may even mean uh, running for office and being in office. We need Christians that hopefully will not be corrupt by a system. But like men and women in the Old Testament, the apostles in the New. We are to do what is right in God's eyes, which sometimes means disobeying the commands of leaders. Like our brothers and sisters around the world, we are to be peacefully embedded in this particular country to bring God's rule and his reign until he comes. Well, enough 
of today's civic lesson. And you may disagree with some of what I've said. Some of this, of course, comes from my heart to yours. But I will stand on pretty good, solid biblical ground in what I say. And if I'm wrong, please, you're more than welcome to say, Pastor, I think you missed it here, and here's why. And if I'm wrong, I'll be the first one to get back on here and say, hey, folks, I might have missed it. Now, we move on to lessons on the resurrection. Isn't that great? Jesus' answer was not only unexpected, but amazed them. Let's go back to verse 17 of Mark 12. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed. So they went away amazed. They were left utterly, completely, totally speechless. And it is in this silence that afforded the Sadducees then the opportunity that they had been looking for. Now we've had lots of people coming to Jesus. I mean, this has been a time where everybody's trying to trap him. And now it's like these Sadducees stepped back and said, okay, you know, the broader Sanhedrin, they didn't they didn't get the job done. Pharisees aren't getting the job done. Now it's our turn. They were only too happy to use this occasion to pose yet another question to Jesus, one which they believed would establish their theological position and would stump Jesus as well. We got him. We've got the question that he can't possibly find wiggle room in. Now, of course, the uh, scribes and the disciples of the Pharisees thought they had found one that he couldn't wiggle out of, right? And he's not wiggling out of anything. He's just talking plain and laying wisdom out in front of them. Their approach was attempt to trap Jesus, and the trap that they chose to use was the resurrection of the dead. Interesting. Go with me to Mark 18. Mark 12, verses 18 through 27. We'll read it and then come back and take it apart. All right? Some Sadducees. Now, understand this, and this is why it's in parentheses there. Uh, it's, it, it's an explanation. Who say there is no resurrection. All right? Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher! Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child or brother, uh, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first one took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving no children. And like uh, the third, likewise, and so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman dies also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife shall she be? For all seven had married her. Gap, pause, breathe. There's the question. We've got it. You are hemmed in, painted into the corner. And Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you're mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? Hey, what, wait a minute, guys. You know who you are. You know your position. Uh, what, you're, you're priests. You're, you're, you're wealthy. You're powerful. You're supposed to know all these things, but you don't understand the scripture, the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like an angel in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead will rise again, have you not read the book of Moses? In the passage of the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Oh, you're greatly mistaken. Custard pie, right in the face. <clears throat> you see, our belief in the fuse of resurrection from the dead is central. It's a vital part of our faith. It's a belief that we affirm and one that we cannot leave behind without completely changing the nature of what we believe. It is our hope. 
The doctrine of the resurrection states that the soul of man lives on after death. And that when God brings history to the close, he will raise our bodies, the bodies of everyone who belongs to him, all human beings from the grave, and unite them to their soul. And with the righteous then, they will be welcomed into eternal life with God, and for the unrighteous, they will be sent away into eternal torment, right? Isn't that pretty succinctly what we believe about the resurrection? One day the graves will open up and all those who are in Christ that are asleep in him will rise, immortal, imperishable, incorruptible, and we who remain will be caught up with them in the air. And those who are the unrighteous dead, they're going to rise too and face the great white throne judgment. Now, while this is the central tenet of our faith, there have been those throughout history who have believed in God, yet have rejected the doctrine of the future resurrection. And one such group of people were these Sadducees, who were extremely prominent in Jesus' time, faded away shortly after, but was prominent in Jesus' time. Now, in, in this text we just read, Jesus is, is confronted by this group. They're trying to trap him, to give the crowds reason to turn against him. And in this conversation, Jesus both proves the resurrection and points out the underlying errors that led the Sadducees to this significant error. Now, we're going to turn our attention to the questioners. Who are the Sadducees? How many of you know? Raise your hand. I see a couple, and I see some saying, eh, not so much. You've read them. You, you, you see this, this, you know, you have Sadducees, you have Pharisees, you have the Sanhedrin, and that gets kind of confusing sometimes, especially if you're a fairly new Bible student. That, that's okay. Everybody, we, we, we need to learn these things. You see, this is the first time the sect or this group called Sadducees are mentioned in Mark's Gospels. Now, I'm going to give you, these are the top-rung people of the nation. They're the movers and the shakers. They're the elite group of aristocrats. These are the folks that owned a lot of land, men who had a lot of wealth and a lot of rank. They may not have all been priests, but they were all incredibly wealthy landowners. They were the movers and the shakers. Some of them sat on the Sanhedrin, which is the Council of the 71. So you had Pharisees and you had the, you had the Sadducees and, you know, that made up the Council of 71. They were the power brokers in Israel's Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. Pharisees had said on one side, Sanhedrin on the other, you know, and uh, it was kind of like having the uh, Democrats and the Republicans, uh, the Conservative Party and the Labor Party, you know, whatever your frame of reference has to be. Now, the high priest came from the families of the Sadducees. And they had also gained the most from Roman occupation in Judea. You see, Rome turned to them to kind of keep everything in order. You got the money, you got the power, you got the prestige, you got the office. The high priest came out of that group. Well, now it's difficult to be sure where they stood in a wide range of issues, simply because the records that we have on their belief system isn't as complete as that of the Pharisees. Uh, you know, Pharisees, you know, they had, uh, uh, they had a pretty well-documented and written code. But that we don't have that much about them, either the Mishnah, uh, a product of Pharisaic Judaism, or even in Josephus or some of the earlier historian writers, who were also really from a Pharisaic school of thought. <laughs> Josephus says, and I, I, I think I may have put this up here. Yes, I did. He said, the Sadducees, are, among, are even among themselves the most boorish in their behavior and in their intercourse with their peers are as rude as aliens. 
didn't like them very well. They were selective in what they accepted from Scripture. They chose to believe bits and pieces of, of Old Testament Scripture, only that which suited them. They rejected all the historical books. From the book of Joshua all the way through Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, they rejected those. They wouldn't accept a word of them. They also rejected all the Psalms and the other writings like Job and Ecclesiastes. And not one of the book of the prophets would be accepted. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, you know, and the twelve, the minor prophets, were all ignored by the Sadducees. So they were left with only five books, the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah. Their Bible was only that. It reminds me kind of those churches and those believers who try to explain to me from time to time that the Old Testament is irrelevant. The only Old Testament scripture that we should ever look at or use in all is directly referred to in the New Testament, particularly from the words of Jesus. Well, Again, I got a problem with that because Paul did say everything happened to them, Israel, for our instruction, but let's not muddy the water with truth. The Sadducees also rejected the resurrection from the dead. They said men stay dead. Human beings only have this life here and now. This is what they believe. No judgment. No death to the soul. The soul just simply perishes along with the body. Luke further informs us uh, that the Sadducees did not believe in angels or spirit. Look at Acts chapter 23. Write it down in your little journals and, and you can look it up. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. People, they didn't believe in the supernatural. They also didn't believe in God's sovereignty. But they came down heavily and firm man's free will. Sadducees believed they were captains of their own fate, masters of their own souls. They had clearly been influenced by Greek philosophy more than they cared about the truth. So when Mark introduces them in verse 18 as representatives of a kind of first century rationalism, he says that they were Sadducees who say there's no resurrection. And since there is no life after death, then one must make the most of the opportunities in this life if you're going to get ahead. So in that spirit, the Sadducees' loyalty followed the Roman authorities because the Romans put them at the helm of Israel's political structure. They also made up the high priestly family and thus they promised, promised, prophesied, profited from the marketing bazaar in the temple, which really upset them when Jesus kicked them out. So this group had power, money, prestige, so why do they need God? If there's no resurrection, when why not live and let live? Because after all, tomorrow we may die. Now, in their history, the Sadducees did develop during the intertestamental period between Malachi and John the Baptist. And they ceased to exist following the destruction of the temple in AD 70. They get their name, it comes from two sources, uh, an arist 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 aristocratic priest by the name of Zaduk, who lived in the intertestamental period, and the Hebrew word for righteousness, which is uh, uh, sitzkidu. And they believed death to be the total extinction. There was no heaven, and there was no hell. There's a lot of people who believe that now. Hell is here. There's a heaven, but no hell. And we go all over the place. They were asking Jesus about something they didn't themselves even believe in. And we're going to stop here. Indeed, they were seeking to establish their premise that belief in the resurrection from the dead was both unbiblical and impractical. 
So this is their opportunity to set center stage. And it is on this point that we will pick up tomorrow, flesh them out a little bit more, and then get deeper into this conversation. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for teaching us, instructing our hearts, giving us understanding, because with that understanding comes wisdom, and with wisdom comes the ability to practice what you are teaching us. God, you are great. And oh, you are greatly to be praised. We come and we lay before you what we have heard today, what we have learned today. That, Father, we could even examine ourselves and see if there's any places that uh, we say, well, I, I don't really like that scripture, so I'll ignore that scripture. It doesn't apply to me or you know, however, and, and, but only to come back and see that uh, we are rejecting what you're saying to us. So, Father, let us accept your word even when it's painful, even when it's hurtful. Because we know, Lord, when we get past that, it brings healing and health. God will love you, and we thank you. We thank you for our opportunities today, because when we leave this place, when we end this Bible study, some will continue in study, Lord, for a while, but we will interface with the world out there. Lord, may they see Jesus in us. May we be strong and firm representatives of the kingdom of which we belong that unshakable eternal kingdom. Father, let us be good, honest representatives. We are ambassadors. Whether we like it or not, we are witnesses. Whether we like it or not, let us be the best that we can possibly be. God, will love you. Lord, take us through this day. And then tonight, Lord, I pray that you unfold for us your word again as we come together for prayer and for study. God, will love you. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. I love you. It is so wonderful and good to see you all out there. You're such a blessing to my heart. Such a blessing to my life. Sherry and I love you guys so much. You make it possible. All of you. Even the ones that never sign in, but I know you're out there. I, I, I see those that come on, and I know how many there are. And You just bless my heart. Do me a favor. When you're talking to somebody, invite them to be a part of this. Invite them in to join you. Have a listening party if you want to, or just say, hey, listen, you know, come to Bible study with me. However, we'll call and talk about what we heard today. It might be a great way of opening up witnessing opportunities. I love you. I thank you. And I'll see you back here at 6 tonight, and then again tomorrow morning. We'll plug in at 9 o'clock. God bless.